Chambers of the Occult may contain content that might not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Episode 20. Okay. 20, or yeah. I don't know. Yeah, we've 20. Made it to the 20s. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, um, and we've also made it to 20. video. Yeah, we've got our cameras on. Um, so if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm Jay. Hey, I'm Kai. <laughs> oh my God, you have faces now. <laughs> they can, Whoa, yeah, they have that's faces. crazy. Wow. Dude, uh, did you expect us to look like this? um let us know in the comments i don't think so <laughs> whenever i find like the faces of like people i listen to their podcasts they they never look what i like what i imagine them to be and i think yeah. it'll be the same with us not a bad thing well, te technically this isn't our like face reveal we've been posting the tiktoks true so like true. if you followed our tiktoks for the past like week then yeah you know what we look like yeah. So uh, if you haven't check out our tiktoks there's some and summaries also, of some of our early cases we're going to be working on getting all of our cases out eventually yep also let us know if you want us to post like other things on tiktok like trends or stuff like that um because yeah, yeah just interact with us and we'll interact we need back. some ideas <clears throat> um it doesn't i probably expect both of our backgrounds to be like changing because i just moved into this room or like i switched rooms yeah. and then jay is like in a hotel right now i am so. currently uh, traveling <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so, i this is not my place i'm quite grateful for it though it looks nice on the outside on the inside it's a, like a seven out of ten maybe um but yeah next week i'll be back in my place you'll get to see a mess and a half um but yeah have we got some stories for yeah. you all right well i'm gonna get started uh, off with our true crime case for today and then sure. jay will take over with paranormal and that was my phone let me silence that real quick i don't know if you heard it <laughs> ah! i've also got my dogs in my room with me and these guys really want to play but we cannot yeah. play right now sorry about that guys <laughs> all right okay so go ahead Today's case takes us to Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, ah. To be honest, uh, I'm almost reluctant to talk to, about this, to cover this case of because of how horrifying that it is. Um, We're starting the 20s strong. Yeah. Yeah, we are. Um like I know, I know we've covered all sorts of like the worst things that humans are capable of doing, right? Yeah, that is most of our cases on here. Um, but I think torturing a child will always be one of the worst. Oh, okay, so that that is the trigger warning right there. That is, uh, yeah. Of course, viewer discretion advised. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's 1965 and the torture murder of Sylvia Likens becomes one of the most disturbing and tragic events in Indiana history. So <clears throat> Sylvia Likens, she was not too different from any other 16 year old girl in 1965. Um, she lived a relatively simple life. Um, that was until she and her younger sister, Jenny, moved into the home of Gertrude Banaszewski. The woman who would be their care caretaker for it was supposed to have been the next four months. Um, I said it was supposed to have been. Yeah, because, I got that. <laughs> unfortunately, Sylvia only made it to three months. 
Do we have the uh, Gertrude to blame for that? Yeah, the uh, the endless torture that she experienced while under the care of Gertrude would prove to be fatal. Sylvia, um, she was born on January 3rd, 1949 in Lebanon, Indiana, as the third child of five. So her parents were traveling carnival workers, um, which is kind of fun. Unusual. Um, <laughs> yeah, fun. fun. Unusual, but kind of fun. Yeah. Um, father was Lester Likens. Mother was Elizabeth Francis. Um, so Sylvia had four other siblings. Her two older siblings were Daniel and Diana. They were fraternal twins. So they were both two years older than Sylvia. And her younger siblings were Benny and Jenny, <laughs> also fraternal twins uh, that oh, were one year okay. younger than Sylvia. Yeah. So she had two sets of fraternal twins around her. So she literally was the middle child of the yeah. family. She was also um, what I would consider maybe like an outcast when it came to the siblings. In a way. She or didn't like, have like another half. No. Yeah. She was just her. Yeah. <laughs> like they had the twins, but it was just her. Um yeah, I don't know. Interesting family. I think that's kind of crazy, like having two sets of twins. I don't know what the statistics of that or whatever. But um, so her parents' marriage, Lester and his Elizabeth, it 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 wasn't always the most stable, um, and neither was their income. Right? You know, they worked with traveling carnivals, um, so it wasn't always going to be year round, or it wasn't. You know, giving them the most money, they would uh, work the carnival stands, you know, selling goods and just trying to find a means to get by. Okay. I thought um, when you said carnival, like there were performers. Um, no, 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 no. They so sold the snacks. fair. <laughs> I see, I, I don't really know. Like, I know that they did work on stands to like sell like snacks and and merchandise and goods and stuff but i'm i think they also were involved in the shows in some capacities as well okay. not entirely too sure um but yeah they they were they've tried to find a way to get by and they did get by you know they weren't like super struggling they weren't like on the brink of being homeless type of thing so they they did have a, a decent bit of income um and that was thanks in part to the kids help as well oh, so they also work at the carnival um yeah, so they would they would only bring the sons though, Daniel and Benny. Okay. Um, the sons would travel to help their parents uh, work in the stands and stuff like that. Um, but the daughters weren't allowed to come with them. They were barred from doing that um, out of concern for their safety. You know, I guess they were little girls in the 1960s. Um, uh, but they also yeah. wanted the girls to get a good education. You know, they didn't want them to have to like abandon schooling um, just to help out with the family goods at yeah. the carnivals um <laughs> so they would stay back they typically would stay with their grandparents or some other relatives that they had okay so because of this the girls grew up with a lot of responsibility everyone did the family did you know but sylvia i guess did grow up with a lot as well because of her being the middle child you know daniel the oldest uh benny the youngest sons were gone and then it was just diana the older sister who was sort of off doing her own thing, as far as I could find from my research, there's not really too much documented on her. Um, but it seems just, like, like since she was older, like... she just, yeah. Okay. Seems like she moved out pretty early or something like that. Not sure. Um, but then the younger sister, Jenny, was the one who was there. Um, Jenny uh, was born, I guess, pretty. Or she was she was born suffered from polio, um, and so her oh. legs were pretty weak. One of her legs especially, so she actually did have to wear like a brace on her leg, and she walked with a limp throughout her life. Okay. So Jenny, the younger sister, needed more care, and that's sort of where where Sylvia came in. You know, she was very close, very protective of her younger sister Jenny. Mm -hmm. Um. And so Sylvia, she went around, she got babysitting jobs or other jobs throughout the neighborhood, and she would help, you know, her family. She would send that money and help supplement her parents' income with the income that she was making. And so she was, Sylvia was a, a lively, confident young girl. Um, she is also said to be, you know, a very beautiful young girl as well. As well. Um, 
And so she was living pretty decently. Um, but in, in June of 1965, so it would go on just a little bit, things were still good starting out. Uh, the kids were living with their parents in Indianapolis. The parents were back home. Um, but it was on July 3rd when their mother uh, was arrested and jailed for shoplifting. Oh. Yeah. So they didn't so, really had it so going so well. No. Uh, yeah. So, like, once again, they were struggling. Like, they, they found a way to get by, but... Yeah. It, it still did enough. eventually have to resort to things like shoplifting and okay. such. And um, was that... I'm not exactly sure what she stole or what she took. But, okay. Yeah. I was going to ask if Go that ahead. was the first time she got caught shoplift shoplifting. I believe so. Um, I believe that was the first time they got caught. But yeah, she was arrested, jailed for it. And so she was locked away for just a little bit of time. It wasn't long, mm -hmm. but it was enough to make a disruption in the family. You know, they didn't have their mom for a time. Yeah. Um, but while their mother was away, it was also time for their father and the boys to start traveling again mm. for the carnival. So mom was gone. She, once she got out of jail, she would later join them in their travels. Travels, okay. But mom was gone. Dad was about to leave and they needed a caretaker for the Likens girls. Um for Sylvia, for Jenny. And so he needed to find a caretaker. And that's where Gertrude Banaszewski uh, would come in. So Gertrude was the mother of Paula and Stephanie Banaszewski. They were two girls that went, uh, that the Lycan sisters had recently become acquainted with at their school, Arsenal Technical High School um, there uh, where they went. So Gertrude was to watch them from July until the parents return in November. So roughly about four months. Um, and Lester, the father, agreed to pay Gertrude about $20 a week or $20 a week. Um, in today's money, 2024, that's $196.63 a week. So that's not about bad. $200 a week. $200 a week to care for two girls full time, though, like living in your house. Like that's, yeah. I wouldn't do that. I don't know. Um, <laughs> times were, I mean, times were tough for them. So maybe. I can, I can see why she times were took tough. The job. Yeah. 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 No, for sure. Um, yeah. $20 a week. Um, shortly after the 4th of July weekend, the girls moved into 3850 East New York street with Gertrude and her family. The initial two weeks living there were just fine for the girls. Uh, pretty normal living for the Likens girls until the weekly payments started to show up late. Uh, okay. And that's when things took a turn for the worse. So not only were they being like underpaid and overworked, but then the money that they relied on was not showing up in time. Um, it would consistently show up, you know, one, two, three days late, mm -hmm. which doesn't really seem like that much. But when you don't have a big income, you need your money to show up on time at the agreed upon time, yeah, which it's the whole is valid. Living paycheck yes. to paycheck. Exactly. Um, Gertrude wasn't getting her money when she was supposed to be getting her money. And she began venting her frustration on... The Likens girls um, started out, you know, spanking them with a paddle, among other things. Um, she even made statements like, quote, well, I took care of you two little bitches for a week for nothing, end quote. Uh, and she probably said that when the money didn't come in on time. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's exactly what it was. And so, so the beating has eventually got worse. Out yeah. On the on the children, basically. A hundred percent. Yeah. She completely was. Um, and the beatings just got worse. You know, they were fueled by accusations by the, the, the Banaszewski girls, um, their sisters, such as, you know, Paula accusing, um, 
the the Lycan sisters of eating too much food at church supper, stuff like that. So they would get extra beatings because of these accusations that were made. Okay. Um, Do you want doubles? Sure. No. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know. No, I'm thinking like you. you want extra food, you'll get an extra beating. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. But I mean, like a lot of it was based off of like, I guess a, a theme of like gluttony or greed because Gertrude was a very religious woman. Okay. Um, now I, so, I, I see where that's coming from. Exactly. And especially of like a church supper, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. But like... <laughs> Where did this sudden aggression and sadism come from out of Gertrude? Mm -hmm. You know, she was seen as a sweet lady. She actually, by like some neighbors, um, she was described as being, uh, in theory, like a great caretaker for the Lycan sisters. She was a a nice lady. How old was Gertrude? Um, During this time, um, let me look for that. Okay. Um, She was born... I'm just trying to figure if she was like... A senior lady taking care she of She was them. 37. Oh, I she believe. was quite 36, young. Okay. 37. Yeah. Um, okay. Somewhere around there. Yeah. Um, well, so, you know, like, you know, the, the aggression, the sadism, uh, it, it really was hidden under the surface all along, just waiting for a time to be let loose, right? Um, so, Gertrude, you guessed it. She had a complicated life growing up. <laughs> because uh, don't we all? Everybody, right? As with and all that totally of the justifies our actions. Vehiculars, whatever. Yeah, it really does, of course. No, it doesn't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Gertrude, she was born on September 19th, 1928 in Indianapolis uh, to Hugh Marcus Van Fossen Sr., that was her father. <laughs> and Molly Myrtle, her mother. Myrtle. So, yeah. Gertrude was the third of six children. She was 11 years old when she saw her father die of a sudden heart attack. He just oh. dropped, pretty much. Six years later, at the age of 16, she dropped out of high school to marry an 18-year-old named John Banaszewski. So she got married at 16, dropped out of high school. Um, Did they and John, married? her husband, mm, it's a little complicated. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so John, he had a pretty volatile temper, um, occasionally beating Gertrude. Um, it wasn't. It, it it wasn't super consistent. It wasn't a lot, and. I hate it, but, you know, occasional beatings of your wife back in the 1960s was normal. Um, so she would get beaten occasionally by by her husband, John. Um, yet during this time, they had four children throughout the span of their marriage. Um, it was about 10 years. So even with all the beatings, um, they did stay married for about 10 years until their first divorce. Okay, yeah. first divorce. <laughs> yeah, that's okay, why it this gets is a about bit to get interesting. <laughs> yeah. So Gertrude, um, shortly after her that divorce, she married a man named Edward Guthrie, whom she did have a child with as well, which is very quick to have that child because their relationship only lasted three months until they got divorced. Did she um, have the with Edward child before the divorce or after the divorce? I imagine so. I imagine you know she got pregnant before the divorce, and then it all happened afterwards. Okay, um, got it. So yeah, that relationship had only lasted three months. They got divorced. I wonder if they got married because and she then, was pregnant. Hmm. And then they're like, you know what? Uh, That's a very good point. Might not actually. work out anyway. That's a very good point. I mean, seeing as how, you know, she was very religious, you know, like sex before marriage type of thing. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, anyway, yeah, they got divorced, Edward and her. Shortly after that, Gertrude and her first husband, John, got, got back, together. back together. They remarried. Yeah. Um, they remarried um, 
but they divorced again later in 1963. Okay. So Did that was their second divorce during that mar- second marriage. Um uh yes i believe they did have another okay, child so after she's that. up to f- six kids now right yep wow um they got divorced after this divorce she then began another relationship okay with a man named dennis lee wright he was uh 20 years old and she was 36 at the time. Oh, um, talk about an age gap. So yeah, she was 37, 38 during it. Yeah, so he was 20, she was 36. But Dennis, he did physically abuse her a lot um, as well. Wow. And so, yeah, um, that relationship, she did have one child with Dennis um, as well. So now we're up to seven kids. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and no, so by 1965, I was gonna be like yeah, seven and kids no, uh, and no man. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Um, by 1965, um, she had seven children: Paula, 17; Stephanie, who was 15; John, who was 12; Mary, who was 11. Shirley, who was 10, James, who was 8, and Dennis Jr., who was one year old. Abuse was all Gertrude had known, right? Struggle oh, was so, all she had known. Yeah, it, is it one of those? And it's one of those cases where, like, the abuse becomes the abuser. The abuser, yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, it, it's what she had known, but that does not excuse the fact that she is a horrible person. No, of course um, not. No. That she is evil because, you know, that trauma would eventually be passed down in the worst way to not only the Lycan sisters, um, but also to her own children as well. So Gertrude, uh, where a lot of this stemmed from was because Gertrude was just jealous of Sylvia's youth, her appearance and such, you know, her, her potential, her responsibilities. She was a beautiful young girl who had things so good, unlike her. Yeah. And so the abuse started out small, like I mentioned, just spankings with a paddle. Yeah. But eventually, after accusations of you know eating too much food, she got beaten on the back fifteen times with that same paddle. Yeah. It eventually got to worse beatings. It eventually moved on to starvation. Um, oh. Forcing forcing Sylvia to eat leftovers or other spoiled food. And so at this point in time, Gertrude's shift, Gertrude's abuse shifted from both of the Lycan sisters, Sylvia and Jenny, to pretty much just focusing on Sylvia. Um, okay. Because of all of this. She found so, her target. So like I mentioned, you know, she was beaten and tortured for being gluttonous, for eating too much food, other small things. Um... She was humiliated at home and at school for doing things with boys because it was a sin, right? You know, oh, she was she was called a prostitute. Speaking from experience, like that. I guess so, right? Uh, I mean, like, <laughs> just saying, Gertrude. Like Gertrude, you're the one with seven kids from three different guys. Who's the prostitute here? Um, sorry, <laughs> sorry, no, that was not to you know slut shame. I mean, she's like, like a murderer, Gertrude. but still, yeah, like yeah. not not to slut shame, but yeah, yeah. Um, we, we're picking on her because she's a bad person. That's yeah. that's why we're, we're picking on her because she murdered a child and tortured two children. Yes, um, so you know the the abuse was was terrible. Um, there was a, an occasion, um, it happened in August of 1965. Um, Sylvia, she claimed to have a boyfriend in Long Beach, California. Um, she said she met him in the spring of 1965 when her family went on a visit there. And that's when the whole thing of like doing things with boys happened. So oh. Gertrude asked Sylvia if she'd ever any done anything with a boy. 
Um, but Sylvia didn't really know what that meant. So she replied, I guess so. Saying that, you know, she went to like the park on the beach with him or she went skating with him oh, and his friends. No. Not like, you know, not yeah, innocent yeah. things. Right? Gert, she was just, um, you know, not being direct with the questions. And of course, Sylvia didn't know what she meant. She's like, yeah, we've done yeah. things like gone to the park. Yeah. The worst thing Sylvia said she did was that she laid under the covers with her boyfriend. Just laid there. Like, like what? Um, Gertrude said, quote, why did you do that, Sylvia? And Sylvia replied, I don't know. Um, <laughs> days later went by. It was still on Gertrude's mind, apparently. And so Gertrude said, quote, you're certainly getting big in the stomach, Sylvia. It looks like you're going to have a baby. Um, and Sylvia said, yeah, it sure is getting big. I'm just going to have to go on a diet. Um, <laughs> so banter like that, that would, I guess, turn into more because I, I guess that awoken something in Gertrude and she began to tell the other girls in the house that whenever they did something with a boy, they would have a baby. And because of, I guess, Gertrude's, you know, inner feelings towards the things that she had done, her religion as well. You know, beatings happen because of that. She would kick Sylvia in the genitals. Oh my um, God. But it wasn't just Gertrude. Paula started to join in I as well. I was going to ask daughter, if the other girls like, partook in it. At this point in time, Paula was actually three months pregnant herself. Um, but she was jealous of Sylvia's appearance and such like that. Um, so she started to participate in the attacking of her as well. Those beatings, uh, knocking her off of a chair. Um, okay, so at this point, it was just because like they that. didn't like her, not necessarily because of her behavior. Yeah, it was just because they didn't like her. Yeah. Um, other things like force feeding Sylvia. Um, making her vomit and then later consume what she had just vomited. So it's a um, 180. We're going to starve you. Then we're going to, you know, stuff you. And when you throw up, we're going to yep. feed that to you. Yeah. Okay. And at this point, that's when Paula, the daughter, and even other people got involved. Paula took part in, you know, overfeeding her. There was a neighborhood boy named Randy Leper. Um, but Randy, I guess, was a, a one-off thing that happened. Um, eventually, rumors started being spread at their high school, right? You know, Paula spread the rumors that Sylvia was a prostitute, um, that she um, she was a prostitute um, because she was getting singled out. Um, but then Sylvia switched it. She started spreading rumors about Paula and Stephanie, the Banazuski sisters, saying okay. that they were so, prostitutes. So she wasn't going down without a fight. <clears throat> no. No, like I mentioned, she was that, you know, confident girl who was ready to stick up for herself and her sister. So she didn't want to go down oh. with a fight. And she she tried. She really did try. But it eventually got even worse because it wasn't Gertrude or Paula anymore. It was also Stephanie, the other Banaszewski sister. It was Stephanie's boyfriend, a 15-year-old named Coy Hubbard, who also joined in on these beatings. So they at this point, it's just normalized. Punch, yeah. yeah. Because of all these rumors blowing up, the, the sisters, Paula and Stephanie, they started to join in on, on punching, beating, kicking Sylvia, banging her head against the wall, throwing her onto the ground. And, of course, you know, Stephanie's boyfriend, Coy, he would join in on these beatings as well. Gertrude would find out. She just added on to it. She would continue to beat Sylvia with a she's paddle. She's not going to punish other people for doing what she's doing. Yeah. Like, things... It was so intense that 
there was one time when Paula Banaszewski, the she actually beat Sylvia so hard that she broke her own wrist in the process, and she had to get a cast on her wrist. And that they blame it on Sylvia. And, yep, I don't know what the doctors or whatever was, but then Paula came home and she started beating Sylvia with the cast on her wrist because of how hard it was. <laughs> um, oh God. So, lots of, um, lots of beatings and lots of people that, that, that joined in on these things. Yeah, no, it sounds including, like there's just a list of people. Including Sylvia's own sister, Jenny. No, Jenny. But, but it wasn't because she wanted to. It was because she was forced, forced. into it. You know, she okay. was intimidated by it um gertrude would literally you know like force jenny to to hit her own sister sylvia um she would beat jenny as well if jenny didn't comply with it um so there were beatings she would get routinely beat by um by paul by gertrude paula stephanie coy um, and, um, other kids as well, other classmates from the neighborhood, they, um, quote, sometimes used her as a practice dummy in violent judo sessions. So, like, yeah. like they would literally beat her. Um, how old was Sylvia at this point? Lacerations. Burning. She was still 16. Okay. Yeah. Um, she was severely injured. Um, it even got worse. She was a teenage girl being beaten by teenage boys. And, you know, some of that was, I guess, sexual in nature. Um, I don't feel like I need to go into detail on no, that. No, I mean, I, I figured guess. that when you said that the rumors started to spread that she was like a slut. I'm pretty sure, like, the boys just took that and ran with it. Yeah. Um, eventually, Gertrude stopped Sylvia from going to school. She forbade her from going to school. Was it because, um, like, she was so bruised that it was, like, physically showing or something like that? Partially, but also because Sylvia stole, like, a gym suit, like some clothes from school because Gertrude refused to buy her new clothes. Right. And yeah. so Gertrude okay. was just like, I don't want you, like you don't even deserve to be out anymore type of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so for this, Sylvia got whipped. Um, and once again, started whipping her, started kicking her more in the genitals because, you know, religion and, and, and the evils of, sin and premarital sex um things like that so these these beatings happened sylvia was still functioning at the time i guess which is surprising so i'm surprised like she yeah. didn't shut down by this point right yeah and, and on on the first hand it's like it's a good thing they can reach out for help Sylvia and Jenny, the sisters, no. I mean, as as with most all violence cases in a home, domestic violence, like the, the abuse, the victims are never going to come forward because they're too scared. It's going to make things worse. It's going to, yeah. you know, lead to more beatings, lead to things escalating. And getting worse. Um, so they never were able to reach out to anybody about what had been happening. And so yeah. um, Jenny tried because she was given more freedom. She could still go and, and hang out with girls in her neighborhood at school, whatever. And, you know, she tried to allure to it in lots of ways, but she would come home and it would just lead to more beatings by Gertrude Got it. as well. Okay. So their parents, though, Lester and Elizabeth Likens, within this couple months, like July, August, they did actually come to visit a couple of times. 
Um, and was there no like they, they signs that something was wrong? No, I, I, I guess so, but I mean, not enough that the parents noticed. Um, there was one account, them visiting on October 5th. And so by October 5th, they would have already probably showed signs of abuse, right? But apparently neither Sylvia nor Jenny like exhibited any actual visible signs of distress wow. to their parents. So their parents just... Assumed didn't everything was fine. Do anything. Yeah. yeah. You know, they they left and it continued. Um now they had an older sister who was still around, right? Diana. Mm -hmm. She was kind of around. Yeah, that's what I was gonna there mention. Was... Didn't you say that she was like just doing her own thing? Yeah. One time the sisters, Sylvia and Jenny, they, they actually ran into Diana at a local park. And they told Diana about the abuse that they were facing. But Diana didn't really take their claims seriously. She thought they were exaggerating. Also because they never actually told her the address of where she was staying at. So Diana, you know, let it go through. Oh. Um, so a few things but, contributed to her not doing anything. Exactly. And so... You know, there there were a few times when they were able to reach out to people around, such as Diana, such as um, one of the neighbors. His name was Michael Monroe, um, because he Michael Monroe he actually he called Arsenal Technical High School to anonymously report that at Gertrude's home at the Benazuski household there was a girl with open sores and wounds across her body that would be seen entering and leaving. So the school they sent over a school nurse to check it out but since Sylvia hadn't been to school and they had her kind of locked away Gertrude was like she ran away weeks ago we haven't seen her um, she was out of control her personal hygiene was never good and that's why she had all of these open sores on her body so the nurse left and the school didn't investigate further because she wasn't present at the address quote unquote present yeah wow yeah and i mean like what could the school have done i mean they should have done more yeah but also like i also feel like at that point, but also they don't want to get themselves involved in that. Yeah, I'm sure the nurse should have at least reported, like, you know what, like she ran away, but I don't know. Right? Yeah. I don't know what the laws were um, back in the day. But I think one of the worst cases of like negligence of neighbors came when um, there was a couple, um, Raymond and Phyllis Vermillion, they were a neighbors. Um, they actually saw, like, they would come over to say hi, and the neighbors literally watched, like, Sylvia get abused by oh. either Paula or Gertrude. She had a black eye when she came, but the they actually even described Sylvia as in somewhat of a zombified nature when they were there, mm -hmm. yet they never reported anything. Yeah. Of course. Um, I want to know how they like validated so, in their mind that that was okay. Right? No, so, like how do you how do you see that and not do anything about it? Yeah, because it I, was I don't get it. Like it was not it. just like a single neighbor; it was two of them, right? Yes. Yeah. A so couple. how do you like? I am sure that they talked each other out of it, but at the same time. It should have been the other way. Like you two should have encouraged each other to take it to the police or someone. No, seriously. And like there was a, a later on, like something during the trial, there was like somebody who um, who came forward with some info from the trial. Um, they said that there was one night when they heard like in the middle of the night, just like some wailing, like screaming. And they went to investigate where the sound was coming from. And they found that it was coming from the basement of the Banaszewski household. Oh. This screaming and these cries. But the screaming eventually stopped at around 3 a.m., so they didn't report it to the police. They thought it was fine. No, because that's totally normal, you know, as long as it stops, yeah. you know. 100%. Wow. 
like, you know, screaming, crying, coming from a basement down the street. Whatever, you know? It's crazy. Um, like, it, yeah. Like, it, it makes me angry. I don't know. Yeah, no, it definitely does. Like, com- like, completely unrelated case, but like John Wayne Gacy, you know, serial killer. Yeah. Like, he literally had so many of his neighbors literally said that they would see him bring like little boys into his house. And then later that night, they would hear like the screams and the cries and they just for like weeks and they just never reported anything. No. Like, how? Like, like, what the fuck? Like, that is so insane. How are you just letting that happen? I, I don't, I don't, uh, they, they, anyway. I don't know. They talk themselves out of putting themselves in like an un- uncomfortable situation with the cops, I imagine. They're like, I don't know. I don't know. Crazy. Um, but anyway, the, the beatings escalated. The torture escalated. It got worse. The frequency, the brutality of it all um, eventually um, Sylvia was just denied access to using the bathroom at any time, so she would constantly wet herself or, you know, worse. Um, was she, she like in that bedroom like, you know, or was she like permanently moved to the basement? Do you know? So um, for initially, she was just like in her bedroom or like just throughout the house type of thing. She wasn't really like locked up in a way. Um, but um, as punishment for like wetting herself and creating a mess, that's when she was locked down into the basement. Got it. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's when she was tied up down there. She was pretty much kept naked, starved, deprived of water. Um, she was like, like tied up so high that like she was essentially hanging like her bar- her feet barely were able to even touch yeah. the ground type okay. of thing. Um, so yeah, they, that, that's, that's when it happened. They locked her down in the basement. There was even more cases of even more disgusting cases of abuse. Um, yeah, I'm sure, you know, they would rub like, the contents of the one-year-old baby's diapers, like, onto her. No. Um, they would... <sighs> they would give her bowls of soup to eat with just her fingers, but as soon as she could finally have the strength to, to, to hold onto that bowl, they'd pull it right away. And so there was so much malnourishment, so much dehydration. Mm-hmm. Um yeah. And and during this time Jenny, her sister would go down to the basement to visits to try to, you know, sneak her a glass of water or a little bit of food. Yeah. Um Yeah. Um there was other times um cases of 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 branding. She would make her brand herself. She would have things carved into her um oh, this poor six and year old girl she actually had with a heated needle um Gertrude began carving the words I'm a prostitute and I'm proud of it onto Sylvia's like stomach abdomen area oh my god um this girl can't even go out she is stuck in this place 24 7 at this point yeah And it was, and it got so bad. It got so bad that Sylvia was on the brink of death, and she could, she could feel it. No, you and know, I'm, they, I'm sure she, that's probably what she hoped for at some point. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, she was, like I said, branded, burned, carved into, beaten. Question. Slammed against the ground, walls when tied up. Parents visited on October fifth. You said when they visited in October, yeah. was that the last time they visited them? Yeah. If, oh. Yeah. Okay. 
So, um, it was October 23rd, roughly, when that happened. And, um, it was roughly October 23rd, third, when like the branding happened. And, and later that night, Sylvia actually confided in Jenny, her sister. And she said, quote, Jenny, I know you don't want me to die, but I'm going to die. I can tell it. Did Jenny do Unquote. anything at that point? So the next day came by, she couldn't. I mean, she tried, but okay. there was nothing she could do. Um, the next day, October 24th, Gertrude forced Sylvia to write a letter um, to mislead parents and her parents and any other authorities. Was that, it like a runaway? Um, Sylvia had run away. Yeah. Run away. Um, so, and then it, it, it also to write, to blame that a group of like local boys were the ones that had inflicted all of this abuse and mutilation yeah. and sexual acts onto her. Um and and then eventually, um, so later, or yeah, and then later that day, pretty much, um, Sylvia overheard uh, Jenny, um, or overheard Gertrude, sorry, um, saying her plan of blindfolding Sylvia and Jenny, and then taking them to a nearby, like the nearby woods. Um, and just leaving them there to die. Wait, wait, both of them? Uh, Is it c just because they were related? Was it both of them? Sorry, no, not both of them, just Sylvia. Okay. Um, the plan was that she was going to have Jenny blindfold her sister and, and then her use her and... to take her out to the woods. Yeah. That's a different level, That's what though. The plan was. That's like, I'm going to yeah. have you be responsible for your sister dying in the forest. Mm-hmm. So, night of October 24th, she was tied back up down in the basement. October 25th comes around, and this is when Sylvia tries to escape. She knows her death is impending. So, after overhearing that conversation uh, of, of her being abandoned to die, she tried to break free. She fled to the front door of the house, but because of how malnourished and, and how weak and how injured she was, she was not moving fast. She was caught before she could even leave. Yeah. Um, she was uh, brought back down. Gertrude tried to, you know, force feed crackers to her to give her some strength. But she was so malnourished, so dehydrated, she couldn't get anything down. Yeah. Um, so she, because of this, Gertrude got angry. She took a curtain rod and she just beat Sylvia over the head with it. It's actually described that she beat her so much that sections of the curtain rod were bent into 90 degree angles from the force Ooh. of hitting her with it. Okay. She eventually got beat until she was unconscious, then dragged back down into the basement. Sylvia, she tried to plea for help later that night when she came back to, she screamed for help, hit the walls. And that's how I mentioned there was those neighbors that heard, um, yeah, was heard that, the banging was that and one the of those screaming nights the that basement. they just heard it and didn't do anything. They heard it. Yep. But they said, you know, it stopped at 3 a.m. So they didn't report it to the police. Maybe that could have been stopped no at 3 a.m. because something bad happened. Ugh. It could have been her a chance for escape. She was so close. Um, and it was her last chance at escape. Because the next day, October 26th, 1965, is when Sylvia would pass away from her injuries. Oh. Um, was it in, down in the basement? Actually, no. So um, that morning, she couldn't speak. She couldn't move, coordinate her limbs. She was already gone, pretty much. Um, she actually moved her up into the kitchen. Gertrude moved Sylvia up to the kitchen to okay. try to feed her, give her some milk. Um, 
But then I, Bertrand sorry. got mad once again. It bothers yeah. me so much that this woman, Gertrude, is purposely starving this child, beating this child to the brink of death, and then is trying to like feed her to keep her alive just so she can keep beating her. I don't know. It just bothers me. Yeah. No. Um, yeah, it's disgusting. It's... Um, the, there was a, one of the, like, the lead investigators for the case. He literally deci- defined it as like the most diabolical case in Indiana history. Um, and I don't really know much about Indiana history, but I think I have to agree, right? Yeah, yeah. Sylvia was brought back down to the basement after she couldn't. Um, she was delirious, moaning, mumbling. Um, she couldn't even recite the first four letters after beyond the first four letters of the alphabet. She couldn't lift herself. She could yeah. barely move. Um, in one of her, it said that it got to the point where like a bunch of of her tormentors, I guess, came down to the basement to sort of watch her in a way. And with her last bits of of energy, she like almost tried pointing out to her abusers and naming them. Mm -hmm. Like like she could still barely recognize them one last time. Yeah. Um, And of course that, you know, upset Gertrude even more. She, She said, quote, shut up, you know who I am. Um, Stuff like that. And so, um, later on, more time in the afternoon goes by, um, they, Sylvia once again tries to get back up out of the basement, but she, you know, collapsed before she could even uh, reach the stairs. Um, and this is when they, Gertrude was trying to bring her back up out of the basement. So Gertrude gets mad once again, throws her on the ground and just stomps on her head just right there on the floor um so and then later that night it's around 5 30 p.m um people, they go down to the basement and they find stephanie actually stephanie the banazowski daughter crying and just holding st- Sylvia's like body um, down in the basement after she had ordered her to clean Sylvia. So they give um, her a warm Sylvie bath, they give her new clothes, and then that's when they bring her up into one of the bedrooms, lay her down on the mattress. Um, And Sylvia's final words, her final wish, um, was that her, quote, daddy was here. No. Sylvia stopped breathing. Sylvia stopped breathing. Stephanie Stephanie tried to resuscitate her with um like mouth to mouth. Um Gertrude was not convinced. She actually thought that Sylvia was faking her death for the attention, right? Um and so Gertrude, Gertrude there actually is a place in, sort in hell of, for uh, you. Yeah. In a crazed frenzy, she actually started beating Sylvia's body with a book and just shouting, Faker, Faker. What the fuck? Um, in order to wake her or whatever. I don't know. Um But eventually she, you know, realized that it was gone and actually sorry give me one sec no you're good you're good yeah she realized she was gone and Gertrude herself um instructed uh had had the police called so pretty much they called the police on themselves what did she tell them I'm not sure um that she that she had been doctoring Sylvia, trying to, you know, heal her, trying to save her. Um, the 
what Gertrude said is that she had been, you know, beaten and um, she could tell that ha- she said that the Sylvia had been beaten and attacked by a group of boys in the neighborhood. Um, and apparently, you know, they tried using that note that was written earlier of like, you know, the kids that beat in me, but the police knew. They knew that this was not just a thing that happened by some boys. Yeah. They recognized that there this was, was torture over months. And so, you know, the 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 investigation began. But okay. um Yeah. October twenty sixth, nineteen sixty five is when Sylvia Likens did pass away. Eventually, um, we're just a few days away from tw- the twenty six. We are, yeah, is what I what I just realized actually. Um, so they were, you know, cameras out of focus. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. They were taken into custody. And um, by the police, it was investigated. It was pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, there are lots of condi- uh, confessions about you know knowing the kids and the um, the connection to them as well. And so, of course, Sylvia's body was brought to the coroner. Um, the autopsy did reveal. Sorry, my camera out of focus is really bothering me. It's okay, yeah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um. There we go. There we go. I was going to like tap her close up. Yeah. The autopsy of Sylvia um, revealed an excess of 150 wounds across her body, several burns, uh, scald marks, eroded skin, of course, the branding, and, you know, the words, I'm a prostitute carved into her stomach. Um, her official cause of death was determined to be, of course, homicide. Um, it was a combination of a subdural hematoma, so you know, brain bleed essentially, um, as well as shock and severe malnutrition. Yeah. So everything was adding up to it, but I think that final just like stomp on her head by Gertrude on the night of October or October, yeah, the night of October twenty fifth. It just it it's what you know, eventually led to it. Yeah, I was thinking that any beating after the curtain rod would just, like, make things severely worse, with, which included the stomping. Yeah. Yeah. Um, There was the trial that happened. Um, There was a jury that was brought in. Um, The lead prosecutors, they really, they made it clear that they were pushing for a full death penalty for everyone involved Mm -hmm. and so they actually tried them all together so there weren't separate cases yeah but it was gertrude paula um hobbs hubbard john all of the people involved the main five people um that were all tried together because they thought that that's how the only way that the jury would get the full context of what was done yeah. So they're like, it wasn't just um, this one. Per- it was this group. All of them were responsible. Yeah. They all partook. Yeah. Yeah. After about eight hours, or I guess going back, and then because of how they wanted this outcome to be, when they actually were interviewing the jury members, they would literally ask them how they felt about like the death penalty or like mm-hmm. the harshest sentences. Yeah. And if they didn't, if they didn't like, if they weren't fond of those things or they showed like any opposition towards the death penalty, they would just excuse them from jury, from oh. jury duty because they, they, they really only wanted, wanted the most that would be intense like, jury. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They wanted the most intense jury okay. they could find. So 
eventually after eight hours of deliberation, um, Gertrude Benazowski, Benazowski, uh, she was found guilty of first degree murder, sentenced to life imprisonment. imprisonment. Good. Um, Paula, her oldest daughter, was found guilty of second degree murder, um, also sentenced to life imprisonment. And then Coy Hobbs, the one husband, or Richard Hobbs, Coy Hubbard, um, and John, um, the boyfriend, were all found guilty of manslaughter, yep. but they all only served less than two years in the Indiana Reformatory, and they were granted parole. Wow. Yeah. So that was 19, um, 1966 that this was happened. The, the, you know, it was decided what their outcomes would be, but, um, actually in September of 1970, the Indiana Supreme court actually reversed the convictions of Gertrude and Paula. What did um, they do? So they did a retrial for it. Okay. Um, was it, it was reversed because the, no, I think they were both tried again this time. Um, it was retried because the, the previous judge, I guess had denied like a lot of like submitted motions by the defense counsel of the Banizowskis. Um, so like not honoring that they're like, ah, the judge, he wasn't being professional. So they, it's not necessarily Um, like, it's not that we disagree with his verdict it's uh it's more of um yeah shoot i forgot um the the due process like like the legality yeah, yeah like do yeah like fair trial type of thing yeah um so they were retried in 1971 um this time paula pled guilty to voluntary manslaughter rather than just going through the retrial okay. um she was only sentenced to serve a term of 2 to 20 years um okay um, and then, so during this, but then she actually tried to escape prison twice, um, huh? in 1971 after she was brought back into prison. Okay. But even with that, like bad behavior, she was released in December, 1972. So she only served another two years barely because of this. Yeah. Gertrude, she once again uh, was convicted of first degree murder and then sentenced to another life in prison. Mm-hmm. Good. Eventually, Gertrude was let out on parole because and of her good behavior. Of course, it's always good behavior. It's always good behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, how long was she in there before she got out on parole? Um, let's see. Uh, so she was released on parole in December 4th, 1985. She originally was convicted in 1966. So okay. 19 okay. years. Yeah, I would have been so a, a lot. I mean, around I'm there. still upset that it happened, but I would have been a lot more upset if it was like two years. Oh, 100%. 100%. Yeah. Um, she, you know, good conduct. She was known as the mom in prison. She took lots of maternal responsibility. She helped out a lot of the other inmates. That's disgusting. Yeah. Um, she, uh, she got released and she just never fully took responsibility. You know, she said that she was, you know, unable to recall what happened because she was, you know, being abused by her boyfriend, the torment, and because she was on drugs and on her medication for her asthma. So she never actually took responsibility, but she was, she tried to like show that she was like, oh, I'm sorry for anything that happened, but no. That's, no. That's sick. Yeah. Um, Is she still alive? Um, I'm actually not sure. I, I think she passed away. Okay. Uh, Um, let's see. Yeah. 
She passed away in 1990. Okay. Oh, okay. She was 61. She, yeah, I was going to be like, she didn't live to be super old. Good. Sorry, not sorry. No, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway. Um, I feel like the way that, like, I'm talking about it is, like, it smooths out some of the the worst parts, I guess. So I guess reading about this case is definitely a bit different going into more of the detail of what actually happened. So yeah. I mean, you're all, you're sh choosing to share the not super descriptive things that you've read. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, that is the unfortunate um, murder of Sylvia Mary Likens. Um, 16 year old girl who passed away on October 26, 1965. 65. Wow. My dad was born in 1969. Wow. My mom was born in 68. <laughs> I think my, I think my dad was born in 65. Not sure. Okay. Anyway. Well, thank um, you. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Yeah. And that is all, folks. What do we have now? Oh. <laughs> um, that is all for true crime, I should say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now we're heading to my case, my lovely paranormal case, which let me open up my Google Doc. That's too big. Um, there we go. Okay. For my case, um, we're going to talk about a very infamous paranormal legend in London's history. Um, it's October, okay. clearly. So I thought of doing something more on theme, um, like it would ever be off theme on a paranormal and true crime podcast. Um, mm -hmm. So we're talking about a vampire. Okay. Yeah. We're talking about the Highgate vampire. Have you ever heard of him? No. Okay, cool. Good. <laughs> then this is a story for you. Um, this story, <laughs> it's, it just pretty much weaves together um, folklore, occult, ghostly sightings, um, and there's even like an old fashioned rivalry between like two of London's mo London's most um, like famous paranormal enthusiasts. Um, so those are David Fer uh, Ferrant and Sean Manchester. But um, okay. before we stumble into the story, before we go deeper into the vampire legends, um, Kai, what do you normally think of when you think of like a century old cemetery that's fallen apart, overgrown by weeds, just like surrounded by like eerie rumors? Would you like mm. investigate it or like would you just hightail out of it? Would you just walk past it? I'd be curious. Like I'd be morbidly curious, right? Like yeah. I would want to investigate it. I would not go alone. <laughs> um but I don't know, like an overgrown, old, creepy cemetery with rumors behind it seems kind of cool. I'm not yeah. going to lie. Okay. So I feel like I would I would investigate. Yeah, because that's pretty much what this is. With somebody. Is. Maybe. <laughs> fair, fair. Uh, Got to buy a trip to London. Um, but yeah, so that's pretty much just setting the stage. Whenever you picture like an old cemetery like in movies, picture this, you know? Um Okay. So it's in London and it's 1968. Um, the 60s were just wild cultural revolution, revolutions. Uh, the rise of the uh, occult, occultism. Is that a word? Occult? Yeah. It is now. <laughs> um, and it was just people were fascinated with the paranormal. So people were em embracing everything from astrology to Eastern uh, mysticism to darker subjects like witchcraft and Satanism. Um, but then on October 1st um, of that year, 
1968, uh, news outlets begin to report oh. something unusual. Um, something odd, not okay. your typical story. Um, the Let's see if I can... Pre- so, Tottenham Park Cemetery um, has become a, the site of a bizarre and disturbing incident because it's when graves uh, start to be desecrated, not just vandalized, uh, but people also dug them up. Wow, okay. Um, So, you know, like typical teenager things would be like go to like a cemetery, make out um, graffiti here or there, you know, but not necessarily like dig out coffins and things like that, Mm -hmm. Um, especially because some of those coffins were also pried open. Um. So crosses were destroyed, flowers, flower arrangements were like put in strange patterns. Um, and then according to Lionel Phillips, this wasn't just like a random act of vandalism. Um, he says that it had been done carefully and with purpose. Um, he was just like suggest- suggesting that it was like some sort of like evil riot or like stuff was happening there that included okay. cults and things like that. Yeah, He pointed to three freshly buried graves that had been dug up completely and the coffins were left open, which, first of all, disrespectful. Let the dead be dead. (laughs) Now, when you think of things like this, do you think of like black magic rituals, just like teenagers being teenagers or like grave robbers? Mm -hmm. Mostly teenagers being teenagers, right? Because they're really stupid and they're going to do lots of bullshit. Um, yeah. But I guess with like desecrating the graves, it could be something worse. Like there could be like, like if it was specific graves, it could be like hatred towards a certain person or something Fair. or whatever. I know but the people that were dug up. No, just... you know, okay. nothing like a cult or <laughs> like, you know, anything like that. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> well, people had their suspicions. Of course, this was reported in the news media, but Reverend Phillips wasn't alone in his suspicion. Um, the cemetery uh, caretaker was a, na- a man named uh, William Dakin. Um, and he told reporters that the Tottenham Park Cemetery had always been rumored to be haunted, but that this was something new. He claimed that the damage mm-hmm. couldn't have been caused by your run of the mill vandals. Um, and he also started suggesting that black magic could be at play here, you know, perhaps some kind of like sat- satanic right as well. Um, I mean, and you I have to remember <laughs> that. Yeah, I hope not. You have to remember that this is the time of like the late 1960s. Uh, Londoners were already on the edge because of like the rising interest in the occult. Um, Alistair Crowley, have you heard this name before? No. Okay. So Alistair Crowley was one of the most infamous occultist of all time um and he had only passed away a couple of decades earlier um but his influence just like lingered for a really long time uh crowdly was um someone who proudly embraced his image of the wickedness uh, the wickedness man in the world Is, am i saying it right wickedness okay. wickedest i'm not sure wickedest wickedest yeah the wickedest man in the world type of thing Um, And he leaned into the idea of devil worship. So, in fact, some... (laughs) Okay. Yeah. So some of his personal brands of magic call them uh, Thelema. Um, So it just combined rituals, mysticism, and individualism in ways that, like, freak people out. So because he had just, like, been a figure in like the media like a couple years earlier and then he passed away. People were still freaked out about it. Um, People just jumped into the ideas of like black magic and like cults. Um, Mm -hmm. But, you know, it could have been because of Aleister Crowley or maybe something else socially happening at the time. Now people wanted answers. They wanted to know who was digging this graves up. Why were they doing it? But no one was sure of what was really happening. So, you know, it just laid the perfect groundwork for what would soon unfold into another cemetery. What was that? So this was, we're talking about the Highgate um, vampire, but this all started in a different cemetery. 
now we're finally moving to the Highgate Cemetery. Okay. So, yeah. Let's see. So by the late 1960s, Highgate Cemetery was already a shadow of its former glory. At one point, it was like, you know, one of the best taken care cemeteries out there. Um, it had been established mm-hmm. in the eighteen in 1839, so it's quite old, and it was one of the most prestigious cemeteries in London. Um, it's a place where like they varied the wealthy, um, celebrities, type of things like that. But decades after, of course, it's going to be neglected, um, and it's just going to leave the yeah. place in ruins. So this is why I mentioned it's like yeah, like it's overgrown with plants, uh, headstones are crumbling. It's just. You could tell that it was a nice cemetery at some point, but it's no longer that. Got so it. this is where David Ferret enters. He's a young man with a deep interest in the paranormal. In the ni- in 1969, he began his investigation of those strange occurrences reported by locals at Highgate Cemetery. Um, and he Hell had yeah. heard tales. <laughs> yeah, he's like, oh, people are talking about this. Let me see what it's all about. Um, I would as well if I, you know, could be there. Honestly, yeah. Like, I don't blame him. (laughs) Um, Now, this is where it's not just stories. um, Because it was the ghostly sightings. He was curious. And, of course, things were happening there that were unusual. So Highgate Cemetery wasn't just eerie. It was physically difficult to navigate. The overgrown brambles made it feel like nature was reclaiming the place, just adding to the haunted reputation because it really just had fallen into disrepair. So not only was it looking looking creepy, but it was hard to manage your way through it. Of course, because it's a whole overgrown (laughs) (laughs) cemetery. Yeah. So it's in December uh, 1969 that Ferret decides to stay the night in the cemetery and he wants to see if he can experience something okay first hand yeah would you spend the night in a cemetery not alone okay but i was gonna say this as like, i'll try anything once i don't know <laughs> <laughs> something i live by yeah <laughs> sometimes twice if it you know if it's a bad experience I don't sometimes know. if it's like kind of cool you know like yeah. but he decides to spend the night um, and as he's preparing to climb over the gates, um, he sees something, uh, something tall and dark, and he describes it as a figure, uh, over seven feet tall with Holy glowing shit. inhuman eyes. <laughs> yeah. So the figure what locks color? eyes with ferret red. From what I heard, it's red eyes. Okay. So Sick. as he's climbing okay. over the wall, ferret, he sees that figure figure seven feet tall with like inhuman red eyes he locks ice with it and an instant that like figure is gone like it's just gone no that's crazy once again it leads to the question what is it is it a ghost is it a demon yeah Yeah. or is it something else so of course ferret was shaken but more than anything i think this is where i can relate with him he was intrigued and so would I. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay, yes, I'm scared. But also, what the hell was that? I exactly. want to find out. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so this encounter just set him on the path to investigate further. So he decided to write a letter to the uh, Hempstead and Highgate Express, uh, which were the newspapers, describing what he had seen and asking, an, uh, asking if anyone had ex- experienced something similar. Um, now the response was overwhelming because right off the bat, people start writing in with their own stories about strange happenings at Highgate Cemetery. Uh, some describe seeing a tall man in a hat who could walk through the cemetery gates and vanish. Um, others talked about a ghostly woman in white crying out for someone named Hugo, um, which I don't doubt that there's someone buried there named Hugo. Um, and then there was also, yeah, 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 it's a big cemetery. And then there was the ghostly tale of a cyclist who would chase women down, um, only to, (laughs) and then there was the ghostly tale 
of a disappear <laughs> before reaching the cemetery gates. Like like he would chase them like through or the, cemetery, the cemetery or like gates. and he would leave like before they left or <laughs> So I think it's just so funny. maybe within it's that so block funny. or something. I'm not sure. Because it's not a cemetery that's technically like open for the public since it's fallen under disrepair. Yeah. Um, now what's fascinating about this about the stories is how different they all are. Mm-hmm. It's not your typical- It's a good like, variety of stuff. Yeah. yeah, it's not your typical, like we've all seen like a tall man. It's like, nope, I've seen a tall man. You've seen a like a- lady weeping for Hugo mm. and like a cyclist of a like ghost of a cyclist. Um, but of course they all contributed to building this shared mythology, like around the Highgate cemetery. It's like, what is happening around this place? Uh, people were starting to believe that something truly paranormal was happening there. So oh, yeah. once again, like, I don't know why people had so many different experiences. I don't know if it's like the power of suggestion or something else at work. Now, the story, could be. I could have just ended it here um, if Ferret was the only person seeing, like, the apparition. Uh, yeah. But this is where it takes a turn. He wasn't. This is when we're talking about a, a vampire. We still haven't even gotten to talk about the vampire. Yeah. Um, so this is when Sean Manchester, um, Ferret's soon-to-be rival um, in the world of like, the paranormal, like, community, enters. Okay. Um, In February 1970, so a year after, Manchester comes forward with a bold claim. So Manchester said that according to him, this wasn't just a ghost haunting Highgate Cemetery. No, no, sir. No. He said. What was it? This was a vampire. And not just any vampire, he said. Mm Mm-hmm. But a king vampire. Oh wow! Mm, wow, yep. I'm intrigued. A wow. king vampire. How, where does this come from? Like, where does the thinking? Like, if he's a king, does he have like, like, like a uh, land he owns? Does he have an army? Does he have people? So he does says that this have, king vampire is originally is he from Transylvania. You're not far off. <laughs> so he says that this king vampire is originally from Wallachia, the same region that gave the infamous Vlad the Impaler. So yeah, oh. he's he's from there. He's from Romania. He okay. said that this king vampire had been brought to England in a coffin um, by his followers in the 18th century and buried in the Highgate Cemetery. That's crazy, but okay. okay yeah i'll fuck with it i'll roll with it tell me more it it sounds like silly now (laughs) saying it all out loud but this point everyone was intrigued by it everyone was seeing something and they're like oh another professional's coming through and he has like this theory so then everyone jumps on board with the theory um so he said that now due to the desecration of the graves um, and the performance of black magic rites, which was never really documented. Uh, it said that the vampire was stirring again. He was feeding off the blood of local animals. So he was a vegetarian. But not people. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Love the Twilight reference. Exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Manchester. See, or is it the other way? Or did Twilight reference the Highgate vampire? <laughs> who knows well, so manchester yeah pointed out the discovery of several dead animals in the cemetery um uh, so when you think of like occult rituals and like animal sacrifices what animal do you think of goat sheep okay. deer chickens, okay. chickens. Uh, yeah. this was foxes oh I know. <laughs> Weird. Okay. Yeah. So there was multiple foxes found around the cemetery with their throats slit and their bodies drained of blood. Thank okay. You. So I was thinking that like, 
I was thinking that the foxes were just like dead, you know, uh-huh. like like some animal killed them or some disease or something like they dead and they were like, oh, these foxes are dead, so they have to be connected. But no, like their throats were actually slit and drained of blood. Yeah. Okay, that's a different story. What's yeah. going on so here? So this is why Manchester was saying that this was evidence of the vampire's return. Got it. Yeah, so Manchester's claims set off like a um, a media storm uh, because the idea the idea that there was like a vampire and like a vampire king lurking in one of like London's most like famous cemetery at the time it was just too juicy to ignore. So local newspapers began to run headlines like "Does a vampire walk in Highgate?" Um, and soon the yes. legend of the Highgate vampire was born. Cool. So this is when things reach a fever pitch because on the night of March 13th, 1970, that evening, Manchester and Ferret appeared uh, in a new segment on the produced by the t- um, ITV um, and standing okay. in front of the gates of the Highgate Cemetery. So it was like a little segment. Um, and they warned viewers about the supernatural occurrences taking place in the cemetery and Manchester just doubling down on his vampire theory. So, so let's say that you turn the TV on and you hear that news. Like, what is your first instinct? Like, do you keep watching it? Do you turn it off? Like, what do yeah. you do? Like, whoa, vampire. Uh, what the hell's going on here? And I watch that. Okay. Well, by 8 p.m. that night, um, a crowd had gathered outside of the gates. Nearly a hundred people showed up to the cemetery. Wow. They literally just said like, hey, heads up, don't come here. Paranormal activity, there's a vampire. Almost a hundred people went to the cemetery. Of course. Of course. Now. Of course. Vampire out here, do not come. So the people that came, so the people that were a mixed group, they had different intentions, some of them fixes, and some just had flashlights. (laughs) Dude, they were going to kill this thing. So some were just curious and other ones were really like a vampire, not in my street or like not in my town. Yeah. Yeah. but they were ready to hunt down the Highgate vampire. That's kind of like, that's kind of metal actually. Yeah. Like that's kind of sick. I would actually love like listeners, if like your grandpa or your mother, or you know, someone that like was part of this group, please let us know. Like, I want to know what they were thinking what was going through their head. Uh, but once again, this is like a cemetery cool. that's been closed off. It's just fallen under like disrepair. Uh, so mm-hmm. people, those hundreds of people start to climb over the cemetery 10 foot walls. Holy shit. Yes. They're determined to get in. It's like the whole scene from like Beauty and the Beast when like all the villages are going to like the castle. It's literally people climbing over a 10 foot wall, searching through like overgrown graves, hoping to catch a glimpse of the creature. Yeah. Honestly. No, hoping to catch a glimpse of the creature. Yeah, fever dream, but um, would I partake in that? That's fun. I would Sounds say. Sounds fun. Yes. That's fun. Sounds fun. Yes. On. Especially, yeah, especially when, like, when there's a hundred people. Like if it's just like me and like seven other people, maybe not. But a hundred? Yeah. When other people, maybe not. But a hundred? Yeah. Like ready to like stab this vampire? Nothing. came from the like ready to like stab this vampire nothing well duh you scared him away exactly it's like if you report of him on the news he's gonna book a vampire hunt um but that commentary one evening (laughs) and according to manchester Luisa was possessed by demonic forces and had led him straight to the resting place of the king vampire. 
Okay. Okay, Louisa. Okay, Manchester. So, um, where is this resting place? Like, what? <laughs> oh, we'll get into the is resting place. Is he just place. sleeping there? Yo, we, we'll, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm no, excited. Great question. But... Yeah, because I don't know if Manchester got jealous that like a hundred people showed up to kill the vampire or if he wasn't okay with that. Um, because Manchester claimed that he went into a crypt and that when he opened the coffin instead of the crypt, he found the body that appeared to be neither alive nor dead. <clears throat> he said that he wanted okay. to drive a stake uh, through its heart right there and there, but his he assistant should've. terrified of committing sacrilege uh, convince him to hold off. <sighs> Bruh. Yeah. So instead... Just drive the steak, steak, steak through it. <laughs> like, just, just do it. If you think yeah. it's a vampire, just do it. Like, if you're that convinced... <laughs> just do it. Do it. Do it. Um, yeah. So instead, Manchester just sprinkled the coffin with holy water, garlic, salt, and he left the crypt doors open, hoping that the sunlight so the would finish the job. It's the good stuff, yeah. So uh, all the classic stuff, yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, so over the next few years, the legend of the Highgate vampire continued to grow. Uh, Manchester and Ferret became rivals, each claiming to be the true expert of supernatural events at Highgate. Um, and Manchester just continued insisting that the vampire was real and that he was the one, the only one equipped to destroy it. Now, Ferret, on the other hand, he was mostly focused on conducting seances, exorcisms, and hoping to rid the cemetery of, it, of its dark forces through, like, spiritual means. Got it. So, one man is like, it's vampires. So man, yeah, Manchester was like, oh, it's a vampire. That's so mysterious. And the other <laughs> guy was like, this is evil. We need to get rid of it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, let's cleanse this. <laughs> That's you know. Manchester versus Ferret. Yeah. Yeah. I honest, I agree with Ferret. Like, let's like get rid of the stuff here. That's not. So really cool. you know how like there's strange things being discovered in the cemetery, like the foxes with their throats slit. Yeah. Okay. So there's one more odd thing that happens because um, things take okay. a dark turn in 1973. Okay. Uh, when a group of schoolgirls, uh, once again, are just casually strolling through an overgrown cemetery, um, but they discover a headless body. Oh. It's not just any headless body, though. It's headless, and it's charred. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> like, the whole body is just... Charred. Burnt? Okay. Okay. The body had now how do you speculate that like what yeah. evidence do you need to determine something's connected to a black magic ritual exactly. like what especially coming from the cops i'm like what you're not an expert on that you should be like murder like there's a killer out there but they're like no no yeah seriously and of course, Manchester took advantage of the situation and he, you know, he pointed uh, to this as further evidence of the vampire's influence, uh, claiming that his satanic followers were trying to res uh, resurrect the king vampire by offering him human sacrifices. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you're just done with the people that are like, it's a vampire. No, like, <laughs> I love it. But it's like, how are you that dedicated to it being a vampire? And then how are you like, oh, we need to resurrect this vampire so he can keep killing and we're going to kill for it. It's on At some like, point, fucking like Voldemort shit. It's a, it's like this a story Potter has been going is... on for four years. Yeah. And Manchester No, like that is crazy. The go. dedication. Yeah. Yeah. And I love how Manchester is still like, guys, this is a vampire. He's the king vampire. Blah, blah, blah. And then is Ferret still like, um, it's we need to stuff. get rid of the evil here. Yeah. Like, oh, like this it's is two not different okay. Sides. It's like, we need to I kill love the vampire. It. I love it. And I the other love one's it. like, we need like sage. We need to sage celebrate the, jam the vampire. Yeah. Like, like sage the place, exercise the cemetery type uh, of thing. 
listeners, let us know which side you guys are on. <laughs> are you with Manchester? Not gonna lie. Oh wow! I'm I... cleanse that shit. Oh wow! Oh my god! Okay. <laughs> Manchester side. All right. Well, let us um, know. I don't know. Just because I think, what you like... think guys. Okay, I Manchester, think it's cool Manchester that he's a vampire, side. but the, like the cult like <laughs> shit where people are like, oh my god, like kill him to bring him or kill people to bring him back to give sacrifices. <laughs> With Manchester until the dead foxes, once we get to the charred headless body, that's when I'm out. Fair. So he Fair. had me for Valid. like the first three years. And then like the fourth year, I'm like, nah, that's too much. Got it, got it. Maybe for the first like year, maybe Manchester could have, you know, had me. But after that, it was just like, nah, Ferret, Ferret knows what's going on. You need to clean this place. Like, <laughs> anyway, no, yeah, you're good, let you're us good. know, but continue on. <laughs> yeah, so once again, the discovery of the body, like the charred headless body, just like reignited the public interest in the case. And once again... The media descended on Highgate Cemetery. They were eager for updates and the supposed vampire. Um, but by this time, like we both have, uh, there's a sense of skepticism. <laughs> Took them four Good. years, but they finally got there. Good. Um, Good. Now, while Manchester and Farrah continued to like insist that something supernatural was at work, uh, many began to just wonder if the story was much simpler. Maybe just a case of like disturbed, a disturbed individual just committing like horrific crimes in the name of like the occult. Honestly, that's what it could be. Yeah. So as time passed, the public's interest in Highgate just began to fade. Uh, Manchester and Ferret continued their feud for years, though. Uh, Manchester and Ferret continued their feud for years, trying to. Um, they even challenged each other to like years. Each was each was <laughs> yeah. what? what does this magical duel entail like what were they doing were they like casting spells at each other <laughs> or were I'm they thinking. like throwing potions at each other or like <laughs> unfortunately it's unclear whether the duel ever happened that's so sad but yeah they're like just fighting along about it's a vampire no it's just like bad aura I challenge you to a magical duel yeah. Um, so, by the 1990s, both men um, had largely, f largely faded from the spotlight. Manchester, um, who claimed to have been like ordained as a bishop by the old Catholic Church, church um, still maintained that he had encountered the vampire of Highgate Cemetery. Uh, and during this whole time, Fair just continued to explore the occult until his death in 2019. <clears throat> Wow. Um, but so yeah. Pretty recent. How oh, old? yeah, definitely. Oh. Um, How so, old was he when he died? Ooh, that's do a good know? question. I do not know. Let's see. Do some quick math. <laughs> if I can do quick math. <laughs> I can't. Oh, I completely erased the F. When did Eric die? <laughs> uh... Shoot, let me take. I might have to get back to you on this. Yeah, that's fine. Um, or do you know when he was born? What year? I do not know when he was born. That's fine. I sh should have been better prepared. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. You're good. Um, um, it's not really important anyway. So. Yeah, you know. He, you anyway, know. they had their feud, and then Ferret, you know, passed away 2019. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so far the legend of the Highgate vampire lives on. Um. No hard evidence from either side, but whether or not there was truly a vampire stalking the overgrown like crypts of like Highgate Cemetery, um, we may just never know. Um, but the legend has just become part of like London's paranormal lore, and of course, That's people cool. want to go visit, want to go see, want to see if they can find anything. I like visit. That. I would as well, honestly. I'm like, where is that crypt? Yeah. Where's the king's resting place? You know, yeah. like 
I want to find out, go down there, and then I'll drive that stake through his heart. So, because why not? Yeah. You know, it. I'll do. I'll do. I'll do what they couldn't do, which was anything, to be honest. Pretty much, yeah. I was gonna be like, you I don't know, think we any. Should go there, and then we'll be the investigators. Exactly. We'll be like, hey, <laughs> folks. Um, so Manchester and Ferret are gone. It's our turn now. Yeah, like it's our time to shine. Yeah. Let's see. We'll be in, finally in our like ghost hunting era. <laughs> Vampire hunting <laughs> era. Vampire, just like our one improv scene. <laughs> ghost hunters Honestly. looking for the vampire. <laughs> <laughs> Which I found very funny because like as I was like trying to find a case, I was like, oh, vampires. It's like, ha, ah, we literally just covered vampires type of thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, but yeah, this is the Highgate Cemetery. It's a huge, huge, like, paranormal case, like, within the community. People are aware of it. Paranormal case, like, within the community. People are aware of where is or buried at Highgate Cemetery. Um, um, and there's... doesn't really work well um there is a okay so you might appreciate this because it's numbers but there is over a hundred and seventy thousand people buried there holy shit but (laughs) there's only more there's there's more than fifty three thousand graves Thank you. <laughs> so there, so there's like double the amount of bodies that there are graves. I would say triple. One hundred seventy thousand yeah. and fifty-three thousand graves. Yes, like triple. Yeah. Yeah. What? What? Are they like? Are the graves tripled up on bodies or That's, like? I, I'm what thinking is going that it's one on of those there. situations where like they buried like the dead and then like they ran out of space, so like they buried like new bodies on top of them and then new bodies that makes sense Um, also crypts are some crypts are like family crypts and they're able to have like multiple bodies in there multiple that makes sense yeah Yeah. but it's one of those situations where like oh i just think that numbers are funny um but yeah before we wrap the story up what did you think is there any truth to the vampire legend is it just hysteria i think it's a combination of Someone, it's a combination of all of the above, I think. I don't know. Maybe there was someone who wasn't, you know, mentally well. And there was the the foxes that were slaughtered. Or maybe that was to drive the hysteria. Maybe there was something that maybe even Manchester did, you know, to to drive forward this idea of a vampire. Who knows? But, you know, I think the sighting of the seven foot tall man with the red glowing eyes, maybe that was just hysteria of being there in the middle of the night, sleep deprivation. And I think maybe people just really want something cool to happen in their lives and a vampire is something cool. So who knows? Maybe it's real. Maybe it's not. I lean more to the skeptical side. I think you know that, but yeah, um, for sure. But it would be really cool. So, uh, and then to answer your question of earlier, David uh, Farant, uh, he was born January twenty third, at nineteen. Farant, uh, he was born January twenty third, nineteenth. Okay. And forty six, so and he died on April. Got it. Oh, that's cool. I wonder if he still thinks that the vampire is there. I wonder that too. <laughs> oh my God. What if we reached out to him? And <laughs> Deathbed <laughs> confessions. What if we reached out to him and we're like, we covered the high gate vampire. We still want to know if you believe this. Blah, blah, we want to know if you had your magical duel or been. not. Yes. Yes. That's that what we what have to ask know. him. Yeah. If you had it and who won. Exactly. Like, I don't know. He's did you like, did you shed a tear when Ferent died, or <laughs> were you glad to have your your enemy gone? Yeah, fair. I don't know. Um, anyway, just real quick, 
fun story. I forgot to mention, just because like there's not a ton of like coverage in these things. Um, but there was quite a few exorcisms performed uh, during this like situation. Okay. Um, hold on. Like on the cemetery? Well, t- from the cemetery, yes. Um, Ferret, like I said, he was believing that like the cemetery was like possessed. It was evil. He did possess. He, he did possess. Well, he did do a couple exorcisms here and there to like help um, the cemetery like go back to normal, whatever the normal was. Um, but Manchester, he also claimed to perform exorcism on um, people who believe were possessed by like the demonic forces, um, oh, including okay. the woman named Louisa, who kind of led him to. Got it. The Louisa yeah. lady. Got it. Um, but yeah. And that's about it. Wow. That so, was a fun one, to be honest. Yeah, I'm glad that I was able to like, provide that. a fun one. I was like, oh, God, you have such a dark story. And as you're covering it, it's like, oh, good. No, I like, I it. I like the balance story. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, cool. that's about it for well, the thanks for sharing. London vampire, Highgate vampire. Oh, and it seems like that's about it for episode, episode 20, 20 of Chambers of the Occult. Yeah. We're in Once the 20s again, folks, now. You know where to find cool. us. Send us ideas for TikToks, stories, uh, places to go visit in person. And yeah, we'll see. Any you vampire next. sightings of your own? So, yeah. Um, yeah. Let us know. Um, vampire or anything else, to uh, be honest. Or anything else. Like, let us know your experiences. We would love to cover them. Maybe yeah. we'll feature some on our TikTok or something like that. Uh, we've got some ideas brewing up. So, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Stay stay with us. Uh, we are cooking up some stuff, as the youngins do say. <laughs> Is um, that what they say nowadays? It's not skibbity? Yeah. <laughs> well, that too. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Stay curious. Stay safe, folks. Till next time. Have a good one. Bye. Thanks for listening to Chambers of the Occult. For photos, sources, and anything else mentioned during the episode, check out our website at chambersoftheoccult.com. You'll find everything you need there if you do find yourself wanting more. You can also follow us on all of our socials at Chambers of the Occult and on Twitter at C-O-T-O Podcast. If you have any questions, comments, recommendations, personal anecdotes, or concerns, let us know. Fill out our contact form on our website, email us at chambersoftheoccult at gmail.com, or leave us a message on our socials. We would love to hear from you. And if you enjoyed what you heard, we would greatly appreciate it if you could drop a like, leave a comment, and subscribe. It is absolutely the best way to show your support, and it would mean the world. Until next time. I see you.